geeks, weebs, nerds, and other unfortunates I've been fervently waiting for has finally arrived. It's time for TMI Confessionals of the Nerd Confessionals Kind. Of the nerd Confessionals kind. of the Nerd Kind. And now, your hosts, Jeff. Nerf Herder Chandler, Jim Kaiju Baker, and Christina Yojimbo Henry. You can continue. And now, let's get on with the show. Here is TMI. Yep. I wonder the cases are going up. I actually had my first thing twice, two nights in a row now, uh, anxiety dreams about not wearing, a, not having a mask walking into a store. And yeah. Freaking... Yeah. It's, it, it's like taking off your helmet in space. You'd be right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what the? Uh, anyways. All right. Do we want to get into this? Yeah. Our we first news item is actually not. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like Christine has got a lot going on. She has better things to do. She's got another podcast to see. No. Many podcasts to see. Many this podcasts. Week. Hey, you got to press the flesh, man. You got to get out there. Does it promote itself? Does it? It's very sad, but it does not. It, it does would be not. nice if the book would just walk up to people and right? say, Hello. Hey, you, and me. Yo, you want to see what's inside? Yo. Well, it, maybe it'll do that on log. the shelf in Target. You know, maybe that's <laughs> it'll, it'll grab a lot of people's attention if they've got it on a big display. That would be awesome. That's, that's yes. if people can go to Target. Yeah, it's got groceries. It Lots does. Are that is true. I Lots guess of people. My, oh yeah, yeah. The only Target I have is up near you. I don't go to Target. So. Jefferson Valley. They got a Target, don't they? <gasps> no. no. No Target. No Target. I, I gotta oh, go God. to Mount Kisco. I gotta go to Mount Kisco, or I gotta go up to you. That's mm. so crazy That's that you have no Target. Like no. Target here is like the most ubiquitous thing. They yeah, my parents these, like, had a Target long before we. Yeah. They have mini Targets. So mini they're like. Targets? Yeah, they're like mm -hmm. mini. They're on like so many corners like you can't walk a, like a mile yeah. without seeing the yeah. target yeah i got employees in my kitchen from target there's a little nook <laughs> in the in the corner of my room <laughs> all righty uh so i guess we're in right we're, we're yeah. actually talking and people are listening to us now we maybe know. yeah maybe <laughs> maybe well listen hey i just you know jim just uh, dropped a number on me yesterday that uh, we were pushing thirty thousand unique downloads so yes someone's listening to us and in the past hey. week we have had so many downloads from the washington dc area what is that, that all uh, about thanks to whoever it is out there that's that's been listening is that or, congress are they bored? maybe it could be every single member <laughs> it's not like congress. they're doing anything else right it's not like we're uh, doing any promoting ourselves no <laughs> so thank you to whoever's doing that Yes, uh, spread and, the and word. And if you're, if you're making that effort, if it's maybe, maybe it's just one or two people, who knows, that's just it's listening to every single episode. But if you're making the effort to listen to all these episodes, then make a little extra effort and email us. Tell us how we're doing. How about you actually go on to uh, Apple uh, Podcasts and uh, drop us a review? Ooh, that because would be nice. Because we, we are very vain and we love it when people say nice things about us. Right. Although I get the feeling that it's we're we're bound we're due for a bad review. <laughs> We've got nothing but raves so far. Thanks, mom. By the way. Anyways, uh, should we get into some news? Yes. Yeah. All right. We'll we'll start with the news. And I'm not very happy about this first news item. I woke up this morning to find out that Wilfred Brimley has passed away. Yeah. Now I know for a fact that there's people out there listening who are like, wait, he, he was still alive. Yeah, unfortunately, because I he, was one of those people. I, I thought it was <laughs> I thought it was an old post, like it was like a Facebook memory. He looked like he was 85 when he did Cocoon. <laughs> uh, but I think we should all take a moment to mourn the passing of Blair. Yes, Blair. Although, this, this yeah. definitely some boot voodoo bullish. I hope his family did not have him locked in the outhouse in the backyard <laughs> like I hope Blair not. was. Yeah, he was trying to fight off diabetes. They finally um, broke down the door and they saw a, a flying saucer half built. <laughs> he was leaving this planet. Smart move. <laughs> Smart move, by the way. Uh, yeah, I know what Cocoon was, uh, but he's also uh, get into some nerd territory was Noah in the uh, beautifully uh, made for television Ewok Battle of Endor, which was uh, one of the two 
Star Wars uh, direct the TV. And he, movies. and lest we forget, he was the high point of John Woo's Hard oh, Target. Right. <laughs> yes, which we reviewed, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Much to Christina's chagrin. It's like we're using the word, the term high point. Like yeah. very high point, high point. Here. Oh, listen, man. <laughs> Wilford Brimley with, with flowing locks on a horse. And that with, Cajun a, with a Cajun accent. With that Cajun accent. Uh, you will be missed, sir. You will be missed. So... So yeah, that's the bummer news up front. Do we want to talk Emmy nominations at all? Do we care? There's some surprising numbers. I only gave them a cursory glance, so I don't know. Really. Well, I don't really have any other uh, big news items, but mm -hmm. um, Netflix, 160 nominations. Wow. That's pretty massive. Considering how many, you know, how much original content they put out, I- But a lot of it's I'm not, not surprised, good. But I mean- but, you know, I, everybody's paying attention to the streaming services now because mm -hmm. we're looking inwards for our entertainment rather than outwards. Yeah. It's interesting because before the nominations were announced, and I didn't really look at them because I don't watch a ton of TV, but I just see right. an article go by. I can't remember if it was on Hollywood Reporter or Variety where some industry insider was talking about how different the process was for the Emmy nominations this year, because normally there would be this sort of big push by the networks to get their content, you know, um, in front of the, you know, the Emmy voters. So they would be sending actors to do panels, like there'd be for your consideration ads, there would right. be kind of stuff going on that really didn't happen this year because of COVID. And this particular person in the article said that they hoped that meant there would be less of sort of the usual suspects Suspect. and then and that does seem to be the case though because i'm looking at the list um yeah and that you know so i i do have a subscription to hollywood reporter and i love those big bundled booklets for your consideration and it's like <laughs> you know this is a saddle bound little book that's costing them <laughs> millions of dollars to produce and polybag into this book that may or may not woo you one way or the other it doesn't matter Right. I think they're kind of, they're, they're fun little pieces of history, but uh, yeah, I'm looking at right here. I'm looking at the top drama series and you've got AMC, Netflix, Hulu, BBC America, Disney plus Mandalorian got 15 nominations, which is pretty impressive, including most of them are in the technical fields. Did baby Yoda get a nomination? <laughs> he should have, <laughs> he should best uh, physical prop or uh, Carl Weathers. I'd love that. No, Carl Weathers. Yeah. Uh, Watchmen on HBO got 26 nominations, which I did not watch. No, neither did I. That yeah. was not watched in this household. No, but, I, but it's, I don't know why I didn't watch it because I know why I didn't watch it because I just don't have time unless I really care. I like the movie. I love the comic series. Um, I tried I heard, the first episode and I just, uh, I wasn't was following. Much. Yeah, gotcha. I don't yeah. have HBO, so yeah. it's a non-starter. So, so yeah. there, I mean, yeah, that's pretty much all I've got to offer up this week, unless anybody else has something that fell in their laps. I saw a confirmation that Jennifer Connelly will be in the labyrinth. In what capacity will she be the goblin queen? It looks like she's going to be the parent of the new protagonist. So I don't know if it's a daughter or a son. I didn't read into it that far or if they've even revealed that. Gotcha. But I would have liked to see her as the Goblin King. So I'm a little bit disappointed. Right. right. Well, now, I can't really live up to Jareth with the new. I think Jennifer Connelly as that character would be the only way that you it would. Could. It would definitely throw a monkey wrench it would be like oh that's a cool twist i'm mm. so rooting for janelle monet <laughs> is she paying you by the way is, is are you getting like residual checks from this woman i don't think i mention her every week uh, close <laughs> enough. <laughs> yeah. let's just put janelle monet in everything there you go so so news out we're good now what the hell are we going to talk about? Yeah, it's like there's a dead silence. Dead silence is maybe the appropriate term <laughs> to use. <laughs> That's what you're going to get from me. <laughs> we are Jeff. covering a new movie this week, Relic, from Netflix. Well, actually, it's not a Netflix movie. I had to pay for it. Uh, I thought yeah, it was, for I had some to reason, for I thought this. it was Amazon Prime. But um, I was mistaken. No, it's a streaming no, because it's a new feature. And yeah. I saw it in the movie theater. That's right. You did say you yeah. were going to. So what, eight people? Um, there were seven people. Yeah, seven because people. it's the, their small theater. So right. there's only like a yeah. hundred seats in there and they only allow 18 
seats. So actually, when you buy the ticket online, it tells you like how many seats are left. See, that's you're... the way it should always be, though. <laughs> I've, I learned it a long time ago. When there's a big movie and I need to see it, I'll always ask what the capacity is mm -hmm. of sold tickets because I don't want to get in there and be stuck in a RoboCop scenario where I'm sitting in the front row straining my neck to see the screen. I'm very curious about what kind of experience you guys had versus me, obviously seeing it in the theater in the dark, right. you know, in the dark mm, as yep. with the surround sound and because yeah. the some of the sounds in the movie, um, I felt really had a different impact because I was in the theater with the sound coming from all sides. I'm sure it was a different experience. You know, we talked about that, <laughs> especially like you said, like like scary movies, you know, tend to have that that, that yeah, so the that reason crowds. that's the reason I watch scary movies only at night if I'm in the house here with the lights out. I need to give them their maximum impact. I can't watch it during the day with distractions or there's no point in watching. Mm -hmm. Oh, see, I watch it with the lights on. And, I'm <laughs> and, I, and I make sure Skylar you. watched it with me and if they called means, me a weenie. If it means that me you're going to watch it, Jeff, if it means that you're going to watch it, then I'm going to give you that concession. I did watch Whatever it. you have to do. <laughs> I got there. Listen, I got my homework done. I watched it, and I did uh, it during the middle of the week. I watched both of them back to back. Both these movies back to back. Did Remember? they hold your hand? <laughs> like no, it's okay no, they did not hold my hand. I was never going to go down that road. Um, <laughs> but I thought Relic in the theater, especially. I thought. I mean, it's a very suspenseful movie, anyway. I think, and um, it was extremely tense. Just again, just sort of with that closed in kind of feeling that you get in the movie theater yeah. and it's a very it's a it's a movie that's got a lot of slow build yeah um it's almost like the first 45 minutes of alien it, it's like going around corridors in a haunted house and nothing happens but the anticipation that something is going to happen because there's a flurry of activity in the movie you know obviously towards its climax Right. But the buildup and not knowing what's around that corner mm -hmm. is kind of edgier seat stuff during this. And there's it has its share of jump scares. You know, some some of them don't go anywhere, but there's I jump scares nonetheless. Felt there was no jump scares. And if you tell me that this is a slow burn, uh, it was a fizzle. This is well, I mean, maybe because you watch it during the day. It could I don't be. Know. It could be. Oh, listen, I'm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. the for the very first opening scene when the the grandmother Edna is standing in the room, right? The bathtub is running, and the water. Right, the camera. Running. Right, so that's 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 a nice opening scene because you don't and know what's going. The water's see... overflowing in the tub. Now let in me the, let me point in, out that yeah. water overflowing. As yeah. a homeowner, this is the most terrifying scene. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm like, no, 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 turn off the yeah. water. Turn yeah, that, the those water. wood floors are gone. That is just. I had to close hands. my eyes. But the great thing about that scene is it's very subtle in the right hand corner of the, the of yes. the, the the frame you see a shadow like a shape yes. of something just Correct. sort of unfold you don't yeah. see the full silhouette you just see like something moving and it, this is the this film does this a lot where it's like uses these very sort of subtle mm -hmm. things in the background where you start to have right. this feeling it is that sort of haunted house feeling where something is moving out of the corner of your eye. Yeah, because you're drawn actually... to Grandma's saggy ass. But, <laughs> but, but no, but that's the focal point. Is you, the camera, it's, think about, because it's drawing your attention away from the fact that there's this shadow creature in the corner. But yeah, there's, actually, there, Skylar there, pointed it out. I missed it. Skylar pointed it out. Because there's somebody right. standing there. Like there's, there's many scenes, you know, maybe yes. I thought it was a trick of my eye after it was gone. Mm -hmm. Like yes. I, I tell myself, I could have sworn somebody was standing. No, we, in the we were bound it because Skylar caught it the first time, but I, I immediately was traumatized because <laughs> I caught my great grandmother <laughs> when I was a kid, and I saw some old man, old lady undies, and I was yeah, that just undid like forty five years of therapy for mm -hmm. me. Was it at a Grateful Dead show? Uh, it was not at a Grateful <laughs> Dead show. <laughs> And there's another scene later where the camera's on a seemingly empty hallway and there's a shape in the, again, sort of in yeah. the corner, almost like it's, looks like it might be a jacket or something hanging. And then suddenly it moves, yeah. you know, it's just a second. Or even the scene, I mean, we're jumping all over the place now, but there is a mm -hmm. scene when, and again, I didn't even take the time to learn the name of these three people. It's, it's, it's grandma, it's mom, Edna, and it's granddaughter. And the, daughter. <laughs> the yeah. Edna is the grandma, the mom is Kay. And the daughter is Sam. Okay. Okay. So, 
damn mm-hmm. here and banging goes downstairs as the washing machine. Yeah. And again, you're drawn to the fact that this washing machine is bouncing around or whatever, and you're watching her. But as she like closes it, the, the closet door pops open. Yeah. Like little things like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, even at home with the lights on, you can still see that stuff going on. Mm-hmm. Um, it just okay let's get into it so maybe we should yeah. talk about the setup let's of, actually yeah. talk about the setup because so we get that opening scene we were just talking about where there's um an older lady she is the matriarch of her family uh edna and she lives on her own and she is in advanced stages of maybe dementia or alzheimer's she goes into a trance in the beginning of the movie and she's drawing herself a bath she wanders downstairs while the bath is overflowing upstairs and this is Jeff is talking. She's obviously does, is not wearing any clothes because she's about to get in the bath. And she's staring into her living room. Um, and you see- It's a Christmas tree, but very, you, see the, yeah. you see the little creature or whatever so, it is. So you, it's set up that this woman is not of sound mind and the house is a bit uh, disturbing to be in when you're, when you're by yourself, especially. So um, a little bit further into the movie, she disappears. It's suggested that she's wandered off and just does not come back. So her daughter and her granddaughter come to the house, stay in it, waiting for her to come back and helping in the search. So you're not really knowing at this point what kind of a movie this is going to be. Is she going to be missing for the whole thing? Or, right. you know, has she been taken? Is the house actually haunted? Is it in her head? <clears throat> and then not that far into it, the grandmother comes back. And this is where the meat of the story begins, where you begin to learn that the house is an entity in its own right, on top of the grandmother having her dementia and Alzheimer's, and it's all tying in together. So it is a very intricate, it's not something that gives you answers easily. And it is frustrating. I can see how it would be, but it's very clever in the way that it presents Alzheimer's and it makes it a metaphor for yes. uh, shedding skin or shedding your <laughs> memory or shedding your youth. And I don't want to get into it right away what happens at the end because we've got the daughter and the mother experiencing the house as the grandmother is experiencing her Alzheimer's and dementia. And I, I think what they're trying to impart just from what I read is that the house has some sort of decay or mold or encroaching dread yeah, you see, you it. see that slowly eating its way across the floor, and you know, on the walls or whatever. Um, but it's not like I didn't read into like what the director's intention was in this. I just took it at face value, and it's like it wasn't really said. Oh, this is this is an allegory for dementia or or Alzheimer's. That's what like, I right. felt it was when I was watching it. That she was losing her mind, and the house was going with her, or the house was forcing her to lose her mind. But you did yeah. get the sense that she did not have a close relationship with her daughter, uh, and so that plays large into it as well, because they they come from out of state, right? When's the last time she? The police are asking her, "When's the last time you saw your mother?" And she really couldn't even, you know, we that opening scene. There's a Christmas tree there, mm-hmm. so has she been missing since Christmas? Mm-hmm. The day did. Well, she said she talked water? to her a few weeks ago. And then later, when Kay is talking to Sam, she refers to the incident at Christmas. You know, so there is a a sense that time has passed since then. Um, I completely saw it as an allegory for Alzheimer's. I don't know if either of you have a relative who's ever had Alzheimer's. Yeah, my grandfather did. But my grandmother had had Alzheimer's um, for 12 years. Is, um, unfortunately, women in my family live a very long time, um, and she got Alzheimer's relatively early. So um, the way that Edna behaves, if you have a relative who's had Alzheimer's, you know that that's how they act. Like, they know you, and then suddenly they don't know you. They have no idea who you are. You know, they start talking about things that make no sense. They're in a place where you are not. And as the film went on, I started to have this feeling to some degree that the house was almost like Edna's body, (laughs) that it was reflecting something that was happening inside her. Because she says to Kay at one point that she feels like the house is bigger than it used to be. And there's certainly that sense in that crazy third act 
when Sam gets well, that caught makes sense in the house. If, right. So now, yeah, because it is. You, she gets caught in his corridors and all of a sudden. So if you're going to take that as a, that, that's the larger, her mind is now being seg segmented into all these different little compartmentalized yes. rooms. Yes. All right, I can, I can see that. I didn't take that mm -hmm. at all. That was I what I it. took away from it when I was watching and now it. She's, now she's stuck and forgotten in the recesses of this house. Yes, and like she's way out. right, just like she's sort of forgotten in the recesses of her grandmother's. Ah, memory. you're already making this a better movie than I thought. Now, now, okay. yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> There's more thought like that went into on, it than than I gave it credit for. In hindsight, that because <laughs> I wasn't sure watching this, you know, I, I didn't, and I have to admit this, I didn't work it out myself that the shedding of the skin was like the shedding of of her old life and shedding. Mm -hmm. of no, I yeah. had to look at this online the answers aren't given to you, they're not fed to you. Now, I knew that they, there was some significance to that stained glass in the, because they, they yeah, showed it's a, that it's, so it's many times. Not only that, it looms large on the movie poster, but it doesn't really. But Kay keeps having this me memory. Memory, right. It's a memory that's like not hers, you know, about the, the, her great grandfather who died in the cabin who was sequestered away in this cabin with right. that stained glass on. So that stained glass is the only thing that survived of the cabin in this house. So it suggests um, in the, some of the research that I did that the decay that the, and the neglect that that great grandfather felt was somehow encapsulated in that stained glass and the house was infected with that decay and neglect. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's great. That's perfect. But I don't need to go, you know, we've talked about this on other shows where, you know, I watch a movie. Now I got to go and, and, and dig through numerous reviews to figure yeah, out what the hell that's I what I had to do. What the significance of it was. It got better uh, to me after I well, read. No, just, I'm just like, the oh, two of you know, kind of you know, Because I'm not a big horror genre guy to begin with. So, so there's a lot of stuff that's on the surface that I just accept. And yeah, you know, I'm, I'm looking for those jump scares. There really was no jump scares. But I think there's a lot of tension, like that feeling when you get up in the middle of the night and you've heard something strange and they're sort of wandering through these corridors and they hear noises, they don't know where they're coming from. It was from. Laszlo in the closet, by the way. <laughs> but the scene when Kay goes downstairs and finds her mom standing at the door talking and there's somebody standing behind her. Right, yeah, that was another. You know. But it just doesn't, it doesn't. Uh, yes, there, there's mm -hmm. there's nice tension, yeah. but it doesn't go anywhere. But I, I felt that it went absolutely nowhere. I was very disappointed. I was I, I felt that as I was watching it, like when is this going to pick up? And then when it did pick up, I had lots of questions. And then I went online and read some of this stuff, and that's when I thought, oh, for all I know, you know, it's asbestos, and she's got mesothelioma. Like she's just being the. But if I had never done that, if I hadn't like had that curiosity and looked up, what did they mean? Then I would have been totally in your boat. Jeff, but I had to take that extra step. If I ever were to ever watch this again, you would appreciate I would it. I probably would. I would. I would as well. Now looking at it, it's like, all right, you know, I. What, what was the director's intention here? And yeah, I guess there's a lot of symbolism that I'm missing out on. It's so interesting because I didn't look up anything about this because I was like, this is a new movie, and this is going to be you a know, chance you for us to like, like. Like you look. I think your brain. You're looking for stuff like that. You like that stuff. The minute I found out this was Australian, I'm like, damn, I should have subtitled this. You know, for all I know, that was Santa behind the Christmas tree at the beginning there. <laughs> there was a terrifying cousin it scene when you think that the grandmother is faced away from you, but oh, I know, yes, yes, it was her hair was forward. <laughs> like there's this whole there's this whole side story about the um, the challenged boy who lives next door, and he obviously had yeah. a relationship with Edna, and he doesn't come around anymore. And Sam did some research or went over and found out that uh, what was his name, Jamie. Jamie right. had come over to the house and I don't know, they were playing hide and seek or whatever. And he, she accidentally locked him in the, in one of the closets. And, and she so forgot that, he was there. And she forgot he was there. So, yeah. so the dad's like, like that never came back. And like, like I wanted to see that kid come back in some capacity and kind of fill in the blanks on some of this stuff. And it, it just, it was a throwaway thing. See, but I didn't was, see it as throwaway. I interpreted that as, at this point in the story, because Sam is actually pushing back against her mom. Her mom yes. wants to, you know, put Edna in a home. She's well, like, she yeah, can't like be said, by herself. Yeah, she it needs, looks like they don't have a relationship. And so now mom is becoming a burden. You know, she needs care. And I think, 
Emily Mortimer does such a good job because she is that like middle generation who's sort of caught between your aging parents who mm-hmm. now need your help as if they were children again mm-hmm. and her younger daughter, her daughter, who's a woman, but she's still something of a child, right? She's just quit her job. She's her mom's like, what are you going to do? Work in a bar for the rest of your life. Yeah. You yeah. know, so yeah. now yeah. she's like, a being, there, she's yeah. being a parent to two generations we're, we're dealing with that with my with my mother-in-law right now yeah yeah, yeah. So and so i think it's we're all like, at that point in our lives i think it's so powerful but there's this scene where you know kay has gone to melbourne to see if she can look into this home for her mom and sam isn't quite convinced that edna needs care until first she goes into the room and Edna calls her Kay instead of Sam. She says, okay, baby, dance with me. And Sam's like, gives her a look and she says, oh, Sam, come and dance with me, you know? And then during the, the dance, her grandmother sees the ring on Sam's finger that she that just she, had, that given, she had her. given her and she says why do you have this you stole this from me yeah. and she has this complete uh like not a temper tantrum but you know she's like extremely no, she, angry she tries yeah. to tear the ring off Sam's finger and Sam is really disturbed by this this is the behavior of people who have Alzheimer's this is the kind of thing that happens when people have Alzheimer's it's very very frightening for their loved ones to experience this and I think for Sam her inquiry into what happened with Jamie is sort of her coming to grips with the fact that her grandmother's not okay anymore. Sam isn't thinking about the house being haunted. Sam is thinking about her grandmother. She's finally coming to terms with the fact that her grandmother is not the person that she knew anymore. And if she's the kind of person who can forget about a kid in a room, right. <laughs> leave and him locked in there for hours, deserve, yeah then she can't be by herself. Maybe she does need to be in a home. You know, maybe she does need help. Maybe she's not, you know, as capable as she's always seemed, you know. So um, for me, that was just another illustration and sort of the journey that Sam goes on where she's coming to grips with what's happened to her grandmother. And then, of course, in the end, like, she goes into the closet to investigate this and she's the one who gets sort of caught up in this the what i think of is sort of the allegory the space of edna's mind yeah no when you you break it down like that it makes perfect sense but in the course of watching this movie where all of a sudden there's the the house is like three times the size of what you imagine it to be and there's all these secret walls and whole corridors and she can't get out it didn't make any sense to me. it's almost like as soon as sam accepts that there's a problem with yes. that she can fully she see then she can see it. right and you know what's yeah. interesting to me is that um and earlier in the movie is it Kay or sam that actually hears a thumping behind the wall that sam the same wall that sam bursts out right. of yes towards the end yeah and i'm like oh this is like interstellar it, it's it's her she hears herself behind the wall. Uh, no, I think actually she's hearing Edna on the wall. Because yeah, where did Edna go? Edna's trying to get out. <laughs> now, when Edna, Edna comes back, when yeah. in the beginning of the movie, when they set up shop in Edna's house, waiting for her, looking for her, mm-hmm. uh, and then she just comes back at night and she's all dirty because she's been walking through the forest and uh, what have you. And she's got a bruise on her sternum. Yeah. And the doctor even. So it's not like a, you know, this is blending allegory and reality. Um, yeah. So it is a physical thing that the doctor talks about. Oh, where did you get that? Oh, I just, you know, was clumsy. Yeah. And, and, and as the movie goes on, it actually it grows. Right. It spreads. Yeah. And as so, it's spreading, the mold in the house is spreading. Right. So it's a physical manifestation yeah. of her Alzheimer's. And mm-hmm. so, and as you said, it's corresponding with the, the decay in the mm-hmm. house mm-hmm. as well. So let's talk about the end where she actually, it's a starting point. Yeah. To break open the skin, which is um, supposed to be uh, symbolic of her memory, her old life, her yeah. youth that she sheds at the yeah. when when she's revealed and just as a new being with no memory, just a blank slate. Well, um, I mean, it's quite again, it's sort of quite significant what Kay does at the end here, right? Kay and Sam are running from her. They think, you know, she's become something. Oh, she's like a monster at this terrifying point. Terrifying to them. Yeah, they're, they're like they're pummeling running. with their pipes and she's still coming after them. Sam gets onto the porch. Kay stops because she can hear mm. her mother breathing. And she's like, I have to go back to her. 
She can't leave her mom. And all three of them lay down in a bed. And then she sees that Kay has the mold on her back. So we le- left to, to believe that it gets played out with it Kay and Sam. From, it passes from generation to generation. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think that it does. I think that... Sorry, guys, I didn't realize I was... No, that <laughs> obviously... The, the, I guess the theater experience really was different than the in-home. Yeah. Apparently, this is what this is what the director was probably looking for. Yeah. You know, he's like, screw Jeff's review. This guy didn't know shit. Yeah, I think the theater experience does give you something that you don't get at home. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and, it, and I was really, really... I mean, I was haunted by the end. Sam is sort of seeing the compassion that her mother has for her grandmother in this stage where her grandmother's become something unrecognizable. I think there's a lot to take away from this movie. This is the kind of movie that I really like, though. I love movies that don't explain anything. No, I know. You've gone on record with that before. I don't, and I just feel like a callous jerk, so I'm done here. Um, uh, I, I don't know if this is a fair comparison, because I don't have a lot of horror movie experience, but it, there was a lot of stuff that reminded me of Burnt Offerings. Do you remember that movie? And again, it didn't was in that? Was that um, Karen. Karen Black? Karen Black, I think. And that was probably something I watched on HBO when I shouldn't have been because my aunt was babysitting us and used to Oliver let us Reed, watch. Karen Black in the house and grandma's in the in the, the rocking yes, chair yes. up in no, the attic the and at movie. the end and at the end the daughter is in the rocking chair replacing yes, the grandma. Karen Black is in the rocking chair at the end. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I can see that. Yeah. I'd forgotten about that. There you go. Burn wow, I brought something constructive to this. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff just thought it was a slow movie that wasn't very scary. I'm over here crying. I know. <laughs> now Jeff was had asked already. Now were you hit this hard in the theater? No, I didn't cry when I was in theater. I mean, I felt I I couldn't stop thinking about it. I saw it on Thursday. I walked away and I was thinking about it almost nonstop for like two days. Probably like I just had a big ball in my chest that was waiting to get out. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's just. I think it's such a beautiful way to convey, to do, do something different in terms of like the Haunted House movie, obviously, right. um, but also like to convey, like I said, something that's so powerful that affects so many people. Yeah, I was really, I was quite, quite impressed by this movie. And again, like seeing it in the theater with the surround sound, like there's some sounds that come from the back right you're talking yeah. like the like the creakiness of the, of the yeah. house itself and like, just, they, uh, like the sound is coming from behind you which right. is the kind of thing when you're in the theater it makes you want to turn around and make sure there's nothing back there now you know? now in scenes where you think that you're seeing something i was the just background is, I was are just they gonna... doing the during those scenes specifically are they you hearing things sometimes there's yeah there was sound like there was a lot of and a lot of the sounds are very, very subtle. So I don't know how much you pick like up on ambient. them with like, with like a TV or right. even if you have a, a stereo system at home, I don't know how much you're picking up on these. Because some of those sounds... Jim's subtitle know, just says creak, creak. Um, yeah, creak in background. <laughs> Does creak it, behind creak. your head. Yeah. <laughs> Jump um, now. There's something behind you. But I was, I was very, very impressed by this movie. And I can see, again, like where some people would just be like, I don't get it. Yeah. And it's boring. Um, but I think that if you sort of let the film in and look a little deeper, maybe it's just that, again, like I'm at that age, you know, like I'm basically the, I'm close to the age that Kay is, you know, and I, like I said, my grandmother had Alzheimer's and my dad is 70 and he's still okay, but like, Alzheimer's runs in families Mm -hmm. and so it's like for me maybe it was just such a personal (laughs) personal thing but I was quite quite impressed by this and I was definitely untangling all those threads like looking at the symbolism of this and that you know so let's talk about the symbol so this so Mm -hmm. this this shadowy creature that we see numerous times Mm -hmm. is it represented now is this the dementia itself coming after her slowly taking over so Mm -hmm. okay yeah because, I mean, it's not, I, because it's not it's never yeah. uh violent it's never malicious it's right. just I thought, there. I thought it was the house manifesting itself. it's just it's the there house but but, but it's tied in with right the, but, but if again, you interpret if you, that the house is, is her, reflecting is, edna's yeah. mind then and yeah this, then this dementia this black creature is the mold that's slowly eating the house away I mean, I was interpreting it as, yeah, this was like another aspect of herself that was manifesting like as her old personality 
sort of and as, and as her brain starts to break down those yeah. little segmented rooms become just old memories yeah. that you can no longer access access but i think you should like I, write books or something for a living because <laughs> you're pretty damn good at this but you i maybe think start too, a podcast you should no you should start nonfiction. right <laughs> wow but i think too that because the director does sort of leave things open to interpretation i think that it's also perfectly fair if you view it this way that the creature in the house is like a ghostly manifestation of the great grandfather who is tied to the, the who's tied to the to relic the window. Yeah. which mm -hmm. the yeah. window but i guess at this point it could really just be any yeah and that makes perfect sense that it's the window itself right. I, thought it's the, the I thought it could have been the house right it, again yeah. like i think it's the kind of thing where it's open to interpretation open, and yeah. you can kind of you can perceive it how you want to perceive right. it and i love that kind of movie i love yeah. the kind of movie where everybody who watches it is going to get See something, something different, different yeah. out of it that's why i was so surprised when i went online and i think it was an article in variety where the director specifically was talking about what that skin shedding meant so and because you say this, because the movie is open to interpretation, I'd be surprised that she revealed that. Like, oh, mm -hmm. I'd really not want to, you know, you, you see. Yeah, leave it up to your own right. devices. Or, yeah. yeah. You know, there is something I had in mind, but I'm not going to share it with you. So. so what did the director say? I mean, obviously, as a writer, I'll tell you that writers always have intentions. But like, you know, the readers bringing themselves to the book and the readers taking away what they want. Just like I took away something from this movie that was like deeply personal obviously the director had an intention so what did she intend they were specifically asking her what the skin shedding meant and she was just going in detail saying that it meant she was shedding her the old memories the youth okay so it was a and that was how i interpreted slip. it yeah that she so, was becoming yeah. a new person and that you know that little stain that that sam sees on k is it, it's going into the next generation right, where right. the start that of took, something yeah. that this similar thing is going to happen to k right. and then okay. that sam realizes eventually it will happen to her okay well. so yeah so that was what i took away at the end like you know this idea that it's cyclical and that every generation has to go through the mm -hmm. same you know experience um so, and that okay. scene I thought was very powerful, the very end where you, the camera goes back and you see the, the old lady with no skin, and then you see Kay and Sam, and they're yeah. all cuddled together. Still and it made yeah. that the family, the, the ancient family that was overcome oh, by Pompeii, Pompeii and the volcano that. came, and, yeah. and they were found all huddled yeah. together. And I thought of that immediately. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it. it was Vesuvius all along. I was very, very haunted by the end of this movie. Oh. Very haunted. I was impressed that it's produced by the Russo brothers. Yes, and I Jake, did see and that. And Jake Gyllenhaal. Gyllenhaal. And him yeah. as well. Yes. Yeah. So there's and him as well. <laughs> well. You don't even want to mention Jake? Did he wrong you some, somewhere, Jim? Donnie Darko. Gyllenhaal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I... I, I think one of the things, there's a few things that I really like, you know, it's a, it's a movie that's about women's experience. And I think that very often we have this idea in storytelling that like men's experiences are universal, but women's experiences are specific only to women. So I like um, that this is the kind of story that's like female specific, but also I think can be interpreted universally. Like I said, a lot of people can find themselves in this position, whatever their gender. And obviously I was really pleased to see female director and also just using this obviously small budget, like really to good effect where it's really just about the house and the characters and there's not like all this other sort of extraneous stuff that's coming in. So what kind of buckets yeah. would we give this? You're going to go high. You're I am going to go, go high. high. <laughs> I know, you know I'm going to go high. This is like, this definitely hits all of my buttons. So this is, um, I'm going to say like four and a quarter. Because it's, this is actually one of those movies that I have liked more that I've, more that the more I think about it, the well, more Well, I was going to say, like it, it, it affected you even when you didn't realize it affected you yeah. as much as it did. Yeah. And I would concur with that, that it, it grows on you. It didn't really hit me until after the fact. And right. again, I had to read. <laughs> so I'm going to go probably three and a quarter. 
you know, which is again not low because I always feel like I'm I'm have to 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 explain my three buckets, but three is very solid. Three is good. Three yeah. is a solid. I I am miserly with my buckets. Yes, you are. Uh, I'm bumping mine up. I'm go. I'll go two. You okay. talked me up a half a bucket. <laughs> so so we're gonna leave relic now, and we're gonna go into Gonzo territory. <laughs> with the 2009 Sam Raimi Drag Me to Hell. Now, this is sometimes overlooked, or maybe not overlooked, but forgotten about, because Spider-Man often looms large, and so does Evil Dead in Sam Raimi's oeuvre. And you don't really think of this one right away when you think of Sam Raimi. But I thought it was, superficially, before seeing either Relic or this one again that, you know, had two creepy old ladies. So maybe it was a good match. But I think it is a good match in the fact that it kind of is not too heavy, you know, compared to Relic. No, this, this, this is more does not of a take lighter, itself seriously at all. A lighter horror take. So let's go to the yeah. concession stand, and then we're going to come back and talk about mm. Drag Me to Hell. It's intermission time. Time for that stretch you've been wanting. And best of all... Time to take your pick from that scrumptious array of tasty treats waiting for you at the snack bar, where the popcorn's poppin', the cold drinks are sparkling, the hot dogs are sizzling, the coffee is steaming, and a luscious treasure of confectionery delights with ice cream and candy and so much more to tempt any taste is waiting for you now at the snack bar. You'll be notified in plenty of time when the next show is about to begin. Jeff. Yes. I have to say that this was a bit more intense than I remembered it being. So I, I apologize if I did traumatize you in any way by suggesting drag me. No, you, you, do know, you do realize that to a large extent, I, I play up the fact that I don't like these horror movies. But, but there's some truth. I don't. To, I, no, the oh, there's definitely truth to it. This, there's some yeah, there's truth definitely to truth it. to it. If I don't have to watch something like this, I won't watch something <laughs> like this. But this, this borders more on cartoon. Yes, like it does. Said, if you know, if you if you're if you're in for the Evil Dead's, and even you know, while Spider Man is is much more uh, commercial fare, uh, I can't forget that scene in Spider Man Two where Doc Ock's arms go nuts and kills all the surgeons. And I remember the kid behind me going, "Dad, this scares me. Dad, this scares me." And the dad was like, "Shut up!" And the kid's like, "Shut, Shut up! And Shut up! up and watch it, <laughs> Be a man. I'm not leaving." So it, it is that type of silliness. And the first five minutes, I actually wrote in my notes, uh, I'm in. Uh, once I got through that first five minutes and I kind of I'm glad. It, I said, I'm, I'm glad this wasn't a departed scenario. We're like, I'm, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm not watching this anymore. <laughs> we knew going in that the departed was the inferior one of the bunch. <laughs> yeah. So I felt like I wasn't really missing out on much. So um, I, I did like this. I enjoyed it. I sat through it. It's fun. My eyes it open. is a fun movie. It's a good ride, too. It is quite a roller it's coaster. It's silly. Ride. It's, yeah, it, it, there was some definitely silly moments. Now, Christina, we were talking and, and we never really got together on this, yeah. but we were talking about we should all watch the same version of Drag Me to Hell because oh, yeah, yeah. the oh, yeah. Blu ray that I had did have the theatrical cut, which is PG 13, mm -hmm. and it had an unrated version. So I did watch the theatrical. Cut that's what this, I watched because I assume that I watched, you guys yeah. were watching yeah. the scene. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, didn't so I don't know how movie. far they go when the unrated director's cut if it's beyond an R or, or what. But I mean, from even... what I was reading about this, Sam Raimi was, was aiming for a PG PG 13 rating because I guess he wanted as many people as possible to see this, even with the PG 13 rating, like. Especially if you're familiar with Sam Raimi's film, so many scenes feel like Sam Raimi moments, and he's still sort of pushing to the edge of like what will gross you out. Like the number of times weird yeah. crap comes out of Mrs. Out Ganesh's mouth. mouth. Yeah. Um, there's definitely yeah, a true. lot of like, there's a lot of what I think of as Sam Raimi energy in this movie. Oh, definitely. Uh, and, Stapler to the face. <laughs> um, the the way he shoots shoots to see like you can definitely see his signatures on it um 
I did. I there's certain things I like about this movie. There's quite a few things that I dislike. So I I liked this less watching it. Did you watch it with uh, with your son? He decided he would rather play Fallout than watch <laughs> Drag no. Me to Hell. Good call. Good so. call. <laughs> um. So I deliberately turned on the PG-13 version thinking that there he would watch it. Right. But, right. Uh, from what I read, though, like, it's just little extra bits of, like, when she's spewing up the blood. Yeah. Like, there's, like, an extra four seconds or something. Mm-hmm. I, like, it didn't sound like the, the uh, unrated version was that much more yeah. the, out of control. But there's a few things that bothered me a lot this go around, and I just want to start really quickly with the um the term gypsy is a is a, a slur um gypsy? <laughs> yes this is okay. a slur okay this Ooh, is an so ethnic can... slur so this is not something you want to say this is like saying the n-word um even when you're talking about stevie nicks <laughs> she knew full uh, well going in what she was getting into um stevie and nicks. clearly the woman is supposed to be of the Romani people who are the people yes. who are referred to as gypsies. So I really have found that like the depiction of Mrs. Ganesh and like her relatives was really sort of distasteful. In 2009, like, I think that we can do better. I think that he could have definitely had the curse in a movie in a, any other way. You know, she could have been a witch. She could have been right. anything. So that really kind of put a bad taste in my mouth, especially when they go to the funeral. Yeah, that was a little rough. Yeah. I, was just, I was just like, um, is this really necessary? I mean, I can see, I can almost see into Sam Raimi's brain where he's like, this will be so funny, but it was just right. making me uncomfortable. Kind of the way Jim was talking about the way the kids were talking at Monster the beginning Squad. of Monster mm-hmm. Squad. Yeah, like this yeah. is the same, I felt the same thing. I was like, it's one thing to see like these kinds of depictions in the Wolfman, but like in 2009, like I said, I think we can do better. So that really put me off. And also obviously throughout the movie, like Christine is sort of a victim of like a lot of misogyny, especially at work. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. But I think there's a little whiff of misogyny in the script where it's almost like she's being punished for being ambitious which a man would not be punished for being in. Yeah, because she's kind of goaded into denying this woman her loan. Yes. Because she wants the position and she's up against this other douchebag. Mm-hmm. And the boss is like, you got you to gotta make the hard choices. Right. But so you get the impression that, that it was her decision. But if she had extended the loan, that she mm-hmm. would either A, be fired. Right. Or lose. Yeah. yeah, or definitely. So it really isn't her fault. You know? Right, well, I she's agree. being put in a position, right? This was a movie. I went and looked up some stuff about it, and I have to say, it is deeply disturbing how many people think that she deserved what she got. Really? In this movie, yes. I don't think so because I, it was beyond her control. <laughs> I and agree. I was totally with her. Like you've already given her two extensions. She's out of here. <laughs> <laughs> You know what scared me the most was that 5.7 low rate. And it's like, damn. (laughs) I mean, I thought throughout that she she was a victim from the get-go. Like, she's done all these things to transform, to hide herself, to hide her past. Like, when you first see her, she's in the car listening to the tape about diction, right? So she can change the way that she talks. Change her accent, yeah. Um, You know, she used to be heavy she's lost weight she's clearly ashamed of it she obviously has an eating disorder by the way because she looks at food with like the kind of hunger that you only Mm -hmm. get when you're denying yourself food and she's ultimately punished again for like this so-called terrible sin of being ambitious when you know that like if Stu was in the same position he wouldn't have even gone into the manager's office he would have just been like nah sorry you know Right. Two two extensions, yeah. like we can't do Sorry, anything. Lady. Right. Um, yeah, it, it was. A, it's the manager that should have been cursed. I felt so much sympathy for her throughout, and I think um, Allison Loman as Christine. I think she does such a good job of conveying. You know, she yeah. regrets her decision almost immediately. Imme- oh, immediately. You know, she knows it's not the right call because she's compassionate compared to everyone else who works in that. Right, place. and. Um, I, I think, like, 
the, her ultimate fate is so unfair, which, you know, it's a horror movie and like bad things happen to good people in horror movies. But there are, there's article after article out there written, like, does Christine deserve her fate and drag me to hell? And you would be shocked at the number of people who think she yes. totally deserves what she gets. And to me, like, I, I, think, I think that if a man was in this role, that people wouldn't feel that way. Like, I, no, I sincerely, yeah. sincerely feel that. That you think that, that they would be more compassionate towards yes. the mate. Yes, there's a lot see, of, I like, would think the, the opposite, because um, I am inherently distrustful of men. So I <laughs> believe that they should be punished. However, whatever chance you get, punish them. <laughs> um, touch my buttons man don't you be cursing me but there's a lot there's a lot of things that work in this movie like purely as horror tropes um but it is hard for me to watch her sort of experiencing humiliation after humiliation and it's like, one of these characters that is not believed about yes. what she's going through as well so that's an extra element to it mm -hmm. where justin long who's the big shot professor who's her boyfriend conceding to humor her that he's going to go along to this fortune teller or what have you. I, well, I think you believe it. You know, that's his. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't like him at all. In this. No. I, I, I mean, like I think he's character. more compassionate than a lot of guys would be. He'd be like, why are you acting crazy? You know, he's just like, okay, okay. Like mm -hmm. you've had this traumatic mm -hmm. experience. Yeah. Like you were attacked in a parking lot. Like clearly, you know, like you've had something bad happen to you and it's coming back on you and if this is how you need to work through it okay i mean but I it's the fortune teller character that's more the the rock in this story than yes. he is than the justin yes. long character is because he believes right yeah. because he believes in the lamia and he knows that it's actually happening so he you know what ultimately her boyfriend does pony up the ten thousand dollars for the that is true he exorcism does, yeah. so yes. Yeah. yes he does yes Begrudgingly, I might add. <laughs> but he gives it to her. You're going to pay this back. Some of the other Raimi esque touches the fly that goes oh. into her body when she's yeah. sleeping, and you hear that buzzing. <laughs> and then when she goes to dinner to Justin Long, says, I don't even know his character's name. What is his character? Clay or Brandon from parents. Galaxy Quest. And then the, the fly comes out of her mouth. And she's actually yeah. doing pretty well with the parents up until that point. Up until yeah. that point. That would be the deal breaker. It's like, what the hell have you been eating, dude? But again, like sort of the humiliation she's experiencing yes. at her hands when she walks in the door. And the mother looks at the cake she's brought. Like she just brought her like a yeah. pile of dog crap. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah, and she clearly there. looks down on her. And she keeps referring to the farm. You know, like she's Yes, on, right. No, like she's come from another planet, you know, yeah, because yeah. she once lived on a farm. Um, it's it like it got really hard for me this time around to see her so ground down, like the sort of. This is a word that gets thrown a lot, but that's exactly what happens in this movie: the microaggressions in her life, like her manager and Stu telling her to pick up a sandwich. Right when on the way back turkey club right. or spicy mustard please now isn't that some of that to allison loman's credit oh well, yeah for sure yeah. she's great i mean and you sort of and you see her doing the thing that so many women do when they're in this situation which is that they feel the insult mm -hmm. they reset and they're like yep. sure i yeah, can do that I can do oh yeah. i would have spit in that sandwich are you kidding me you know one big haka loogie yeah, no, I think she's great, and I think she's great at con conveying this, but it's, it just got really hard for me to watch it. And then in addition, she's being tormented by Mrs. Ganesh, who's crazy. I yeah, mean, no, even it's, a, before, yeah, it's like, dude, yeah, I had a rough crazy. day as it is. Now even sudden, before you... the, she didn't extend the loan, she's at her desk, taking out her teeth yeah, at her desk. Yeah. Like, you, like, you don't on. present yourself well if you want the <laughs> loan extension. You know, I was going to give it to you, but. <laughs> and then yeah. she attacks her in the parking lot. You know, before, this is before the curse even happens. You know, Damn. she's in her back seat. She physically attacks her for not extending the loan. Like, do you mm -hmm. think that this is the kind of behavior that gets your loan <laughs> right. extended? Yeah. Rethink it. Rethink yeah. it. That gums was, uh, that was gums her face. Ashes. Gums her chin. In, in oh, times. yeah. That was, oh, that was grisly. But again, um, that whole sequence is so sam raimi right over just, the top yeah. and the easter egg mm -hmm. mrs ganesh's yes. car the car yeah i was just gonna say ash's yellow oldsmobile and uncle yep. ben's and say uh, spider-man 
that a car appears in every Sam yep. Raimi movie. Yep. But unfortunately, <laughs> Mr. Campbell does not appear. In yeah. No, what no. was up with that? I, was I was busy. surprised they couldn't find him. Like busy. he couldn't be standing in the background. He couldn't be a, like a bank customer. Nine. What was he doing? Two thousand nine. He high? was on the show uh, Burn Notice, mm. so he was busy filming. Oh, he was being serious TV. for a couple years. And this seance is actually sort of like the ultimate Raimi set piece. I feel just even the way like the spirit moves from the woman into the goat. You know, yeah. you're like this. Yeah, you know, it's very Evil Dead kind of feeling that you get during that sequence. Some of the dialogue I thought was laugh out loud funny. When they first go to the fortune teller, they're getting in their car, Christine and uh, Clayton, and she sees the fortune teller. And on a whim, she wants to go in there because she's still bothered by what happened. And against his better judgment, Clayton goes in with her. And he's challenging the fortune teller at every step. And when he first reads her fortune, he's got these two questions. Did you desecrate a graveyard? Yeah. Did you play with a Ouija board? <laughs> no. <laughs> what is going on with you? Yeah, well, uh, no, I denied no lady alone. Ooh. Bad, Section 12. Bad. Uh, yes. But again, and like. I noticed, Jeff, you know, Christina, you wouldn't know this, but I noticed that when they go to dinner at uh, Clayton's parents, the cat's name is Hecuba, which is the old witch's name from the Jack and the Beanstalk anime. Oh. Mother Hecuba is the one Hecuba. that fell yeah, right. on the princess and is the mother of the giant. So it's all the cat's fault? I wonder if that was purposeful. If they are, if Sam Raimi is a fan Ooh, of that Jack and the Beanstalk. It could very well Hecuba, be. Hecuba, that's an old Greek name. I'll just say yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's but funny. hey, I wouldn't put it past him. <laughs> I bet you he has seen that Jack and the Beanstalk. It's probably his favorite anime ever. It's interesting, again, like the commentary I was seeing about how Christine deserved her fate. And people were saying, well, she only she only feels bad about it when she realizes she's been cursed. But if you watch the it's movie, not true. I don't think it's, it's not true. true. And the, the scene before she goes into the the psychic is a perfect example of this because she's walking with her boyfriend and she's like, I don't know, maybe I could have extended it the third time. Right. She and he's like, I think you did everything you were supposed to do. Like you already, you know, they already gave her two extensions. You can't beat yourself up over it. But she clearly doesn't feel good about it. She doesn't know at this point that she's been cursed. She has been, but she doesn't realize it. She doesn't know she's been cursed until she goes into the psychics and he sees that she has a curse on her. And then the other reason people say it's justified that she deserves it is because she killed the cat. Can't do that. And yet, you know, to your point, I read yeah. something when I was yeah. looking at some stuff that, and I think it was part of the official promotional materials for this, mm -hmm. that it's described that Christine makes a sinful choice out of greed, and that's why she's cursed. And she, that's in no way, shape, or form what happens. I agree. I agree. And I just don't think anything she does well, the, justifies the outcome. Agreed in the sense that she wanted the promotion? Right, that's what I'm saying. It's like uh, it's, it feels like she's that, no cooking. agreed that she wants to keep her job. That's, yeah, <laughs> right. Pay her like, bills. It feels like she's being punished for being ambitious, which men would not be punished for being mm. ambitious. I, I agree. Um, with you there. So, and I, I, but like I think it's crazy that people think she deserves to be tormented in hell because the psychic told her. The only way you can get rid of this curse is if you kill an animal and she's terrorized and panicking. What would you do? I mean, serious yeah, question. Kitty, 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 kitty. <laughs> if somebody told you, this you is the are only, cursed, right. this is the only yeah. way that you can save yourself. Would you just be like, well, I believe all life is sacred, so I'm just going to I'm just going to suffer. <laughs> you're suffering regardless. Whether you know, I guess you're suffering hell as a curse or you're suffering on earth. I mean, I think it's crazy some of the justifications that people use to say that she deserves what she gets. Um, well, but she does screw up. But I do have to say that the movie lives up to its title. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they don't shirk you there. Yes. So, you know, it's just unfortunate that it's her character that has to be the one to get dressed. Yeah, because you really don't, I mean, that's not how most of these movies play out. You're like, yeah. no. And that no, has I to mean, do with the fact that she put the wrong envelope yeah. in her, yeah. in the old, she dug the now, old lady now, back as up. Soon, I didn't remember that. On, the last time I saw this was when it was during its first run and I saw it at the drive-in, I remember. 
and uh, it's been since 2009 since I've watched this. So I had no memory that the envelopes got switched. Gotcha. And you feel that like that's the most obvious dupe. It's it's like on a every sitcom. Of a it's like every three company. And, and I episode. felt so stupid afterward because I was actually surprised. Like I was <laughs> oh! the main. Oh! I clutched the pearls when she got dragged, like because I didn't remember. I didn't. I didn't, had no memory of how it played out at the very end. Yeah. I mean, it has. It's like the Night of the Living Dead ending, right? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a downer. Like, definitely yeah. a downer. It's got the bleak ending, but you know, it's. I think it's sort of ripe to make a sequel because Clay's holding the button right at the end. So I don't know. Like, Maybe he can does make that a mean Maybe does he, he keep it? Yeah, is that right. now his? Is it is, he, is it now transferred to him? That's what I wonder. Right. You know, it yeah. seemed like you had to be more deliberate, where you were like, "Here is the." thing and this is a gift and i'm giving it to you because she has that scene in the diner when she's thinking about passing it to Stu. right yes she calls yeah. him and tells yep. him to come and then, yeah which and, is what you should have done and then he's she's looking at the old man which is that is a pretty reprehensible idea <laughs> but, then, but i think she's probably thinking like well he's gonna die anyway but then she but it's like but he would but be he's gonna die but he'd be yeah. in eternal torment if she right. gave <laughs> Yeah. I made it. I made it. <laughs> but then she stops and she doesn't do it because she mm. can't actually bring herself to like inflict this on somebody else, which I think shows that ultimately she's a moral character. She doesn't even give it to Stu, who stole her work. Right. That would be terrible if she did give it to Stu and then you're like, yes. And then you realize, okay, it's the coin that she gave. Right. Him. Yeah. Ten like, times Whoa. worse. This was written pre Spider-Man. So some point in the mid to late nineties, this was written, but just didn't get made until a decade later. There's a lot of similarities to the Stephen King story. Thinner. thinner. So even to the point where, like the the main character is faced with this choice at the end where he's got to inflict the curse on somebody else to lift it off of him and unfortunately it's his family accidentally that he that he lays it on rather than not knowing that he's not lifted the curse whatsoever at the end like the you know the lady says to him you can pass the curse it, it's in this pie right he's trying to give it to his wife only because oh. he blames his wife for what happened to him in the story. Uh, and yeah, no, then, I didn't remember that. And then, so he's like, okay, I'm going to pass it to her. She deserves it because she's the reason why this happened to me. And then their daughter, who's older, like away at college or something, comes home late at night. He doesn't know. And he wakes up in the morning and sees the two forks and two plates that shows that his daughter mm -hmm. also ate it. And now he's upset because he didn't want his daughter to have it. He only was trying to give it to his wife. Which, oh, right. Yeah. So then he but, just eats it himself. So then he eats it well. himself because they're all going to die. Right. Well, I guess I don't need to read that book now. No. <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> <laughs> So like 40 year old spoilers. I know, right? Yeah. Thinner. Oh yeah, folks, we spoil things <laughs> in case. I read that Ellen Page was supposed to be in this and she had to drop out. She was originally cast. As Christine? As yeah. Christine, yeah. As Christine. I read that as well. Yeah, we'll be talking about her very soon. I can see that. You know, it's very difficult to kind of surmise what somebody else would uh, be in a role once role, you've yeah. already, somebody's right. already taken it as their mm -hmm. own. And I had no fault with Alison Lohman. No, I liked her a lot. Mm -hmm. I thought she had a lot of kind of Brie Larson s, uh... and she's kind of um, dropped off the radar since then because she got married and and had a few kids apparently. So she's semi-retired. So this was the last thing. Well, no, she was dragged majorly. to hell. She was, <laughs> she's gone. She's in eternal torment. At least until the sequel. <laughs> until comes the about. sequel. Yeah, I could see. Yeah, you guys are bringing up you know the potential for a sequel. I could see that. And then Stu maybe would get his, you know, come up. Uh, although I think, you know, there's only a certain window that they had. I, I think it's passed. I think, I don't think we'll ever see a drag. Drag me to hell there. again. What? I, I don't know. I, especially with horror franchises, like they just come back yeah. <laughs> out of the blue. I mean, look, it's not even a horror franchise. They're making another Matrix movie. Four. You know, I still so wanted that third one to wrap up and you just find <laughs> out that there's all still right in the Matrix. I, everything was all for naught. Because as soon as the that underground, as soon as they had that underground rave, rave. I was like I'm out, I'm yeah, out. No, the second and third one, the, the the third one had to be so good in order to make the second one better, and it didn't. It wasn't. I don't know. I think it looked better to just live in the Matrix. But I guess my point is though is that no franchise is ever truly dead. No, 
Yeah. Well, when we talked Fright Night, I don't think any of us are like, oh, they made a remake? We made- I think that they would reboot this sooner than give it a sequel. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because I could see something like where, you know, it's been 10 years down the line and maybe Clay's met someone else and he's married. And, you know, I don't know. Stu's like, like a big, big wig and you got to take I could, him down. I could definitely see like them taking these characters at a later point mm-hmm. in their life, assuming that the curse didn't get passed to Clay. Right. But if they were going to bring Allison back, she wouldn't yeah. have aged. She would, you yeah, know, yeah. it's not like she's aging 10 mm-hmm. years. Well, listen, right. you, you know what they can do now with uh, uh, CTM, yeah, yeah. so. Do you know, guys know that Edgar Wright almost directed this? Sam Raimi Ooh, almost gave this really? to Edgar Wright? Again, like just different kind of energy Yeah, in yeah. the movie if Edgar Wright directed it. And, but he turned it down because he said it would feel like doing karaoke because <laughs> it, he'd be yeah. trying to do a Sam Raimi. A Sam Raimi, movie. yeah. You're like, yeah. Was there an episode of Happy Days where this happened to Richie? What? Well, yeah, there was an episode of Happy Days where, where he was, the old lady gave him some kind of something that was cursed. No, just me. I think that was Brady Bunch, the Hawaii episode. Oh, that was the Tiki. Was that was the Tiki. But the, the, it wasn't handed to him. He found it, though. He wasn't cursed. It was cursed. This isn't, you know, I wouldn't say that this is getting back to his horror roots. Like, as you were saying, Jeff, with Spider-Man 2, he always had that element with him, even in the Spider-Man movies. A lot of the Green yeah. Goblin stuff in the first Spider-Man movie is horrific, if you yeah. think about it. Um, I don't know what's going on in Spider-Man 3. I don't <laughs> Nobody does. No, I don't think it ever left him. You know, it's it's, so that's a that's a big deal when you read a lot of historical stuff about Drag Me to Hell. Return to his horror roots. I think he always was well steeped in horror. That he didn't have to return anywhere. But it is a return to the manic style that he really made his own in Evil Dead 2 and Army of Darkness. And has he, I, I'm trying to rack my brain now and I can't oh, think of anything I was just gonna the ask you. of my head. What has he well, directed since? Right, I was gonna ask you that. You're, you're more of a Raimi guy. I feel like, oh, he did Oz the Great and Powerful, right, right? That was him, really? Yeah, that's Oz, mm-hmm. yep. Yeah, that was. And he did, he's, hasn't I'm sorry, made Sam, it. sorry. <laughs> he actually has not made a, a film since then. He's done a lot of producing. Okay, um, okay. But he has not made a movie since Oz the Great and Powerful in 2013. That's and with uh, Franco? James he, Franco? Yep. And he is uh, supposed to direct Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. That's right. right. For 2022. That's right. Yes, and we were very excited for that. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. But he's produced a ton of films. If you look at like his Wikipedia page, he's done a lot of producing. Wiki- it, so. Oh, because he produced Crawl, The Grudge. He was executive producer on the Ash vs. Evil Dead TV show. Yeah, forget about that, that TV yeah. show. Huh, he was executive producer on uh, Spartacus? Yeah, he's been busy. He's been busy. I guess he has yeah. been. Behind the yeah. scenes. Just not directing. No. no. So he's been doing some stuff, but we haven't seen mm-hmm. a film from him since Oz a Great Perf. I'm pretty excited about Doctor Strange. This yeah. does seem to be right in his wheelhouse. <sighs> Buckets? Uh, I'd go three and a half. <laughs> Drag me to hell. Three and a half. <laughs> Ladies, I'm gonna say I feel very conflicted about this movie, so um, I'm gonna give it like two and four fifths. <laughs> two and four fifths. Wow, yeah. I'm breaking on the pie chart. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get the measuring tape out. Certain so things I really like, but there are definitely things about this movie that bother me. So I'll go two and a half. So you liked it better than Relic? I did. Yeah, I did, actually. Yeah, if I'm going to be, you know, mm. I didn't have to think as much, I guess. <laughs> I told you, you guys, you know, it is what it was. It is what it is. That's so there, do. there's, it has its share of jump scares. Mm-hmm. So Jeff, how did you handle the viewing? Really, it, it wasn't oh. scary. You know, it wasn't scary. There, you know, there were some silly gross out scenes there. You know, a lot of it's, you know, when she's digging up the grave and it's raining and she's covered in water and I'm like, oh, this is like so poltergeist right here. All these mm-hmm. dead bodies are going to yeah. start floating. And up. how did the old lady's family afford that gravestone? I'm sure that <laughs> cost a lot. The, the eyeball on the pie, some of that silly stuff was was straight up Evil Dead mm-hmm. kind of goofy humor, you know. Yeah. So, Mrs. Ganush there uh, gnawing on the uh, chin line was a little grisly, but puking up the blood that was, it wasn't it wasn't or, like, it wasn't horror it wasn't like mm-hmm. chain, texas chainsaw where people are being eviscerated with a you know yeah. kitchen appliance so. 
It was cartoon. Even, it was the, scene, even the scene Moana when had. she's in bed and Mrs. Ganesh is over her and like spits. Just goo and, yeah, that's just, that's gross goo out. Goo and though. maggots that's, all over yeah, her. Yeah, that's just like gross out. So this leads us to our confessional this week. Confessionals. Now we are revisiting a question. Now I have multiple answers to this, so I have no. I think we all do. I don't think we're all just one trauma and we're done. What memorably traumatized, scared you? as a kid. Um, to this day, might give you the shivers just thinking about it. Maybe not watching the particular movie in question, but the feeling that it gave you as a child. The again, weakness. chasing the dragon, trying to get that yeah. feeling again. Mm -hmm. But this is uh, something different. you don't different. want that feeling though. No, that, yeah. I'm gonna say, it's not, this yeah. is a little bit different than that E.T. warm fuzzy kind of feeling that you got when you were a kid. Do you have something in mind, Christina, as this was your suggestion this week? Um, yeah, because I was actually thinking about it already because I had to, I did a panel last week on what scares horror authors. And um, so we were talking about things that scared us as kids. And as a child, like two movies in particular really, really frightened me. Um, obviously, one of them, now you watch in retrospect, is slightly comical, but um, Kingdom of the Spiders. Ooh. <laughs> Starring William Shatner. William Shatner. Yeah. Um, I had no idea who William Shatner was at the time. I was very young. This, the movie was on TV. Um, so because of that, to this day, when you see Shatner, do you think of <laughs> Kingdom of the Spiders over I, Captain Kirk? I don't think of Kingdom of the Spiders because the only thing I really remembered about Kingdom of the Spiders was the spiders. Okay. Um, and most of the spiders that are actually in the movie are like tarantulas. Yeah. But tarantulas are freaky looking. Okay. Yes, they are. And I have lifelong arachnophobia because of that Ooh. movie. Ooh. Um, yeah. Just there. Was, I remember very vividly there was one scene in particular where a guy was like in a truck and the spider like crawls over his head and onto his face. Um, that gave me nightmares for years. Um, so just the idea that there would be that many spiders in the same <laughs> It was right. enough to be like. <laughs> and I seem to remember the end of that movie because like all 70s movies of that ilk. Yeah. It had a downer ending. Yeah. And I seem to remember the town being covered, covered in, in giant webs. Spider yes. Web. Yeah, yeah. That big pull, that famous pullback. Yeah. And the whole mm -hmm. town is just completely covered in spider web. You're yes. right. I, man, I remember that. So that, and I have not been able to watch that movie since then because see, actually for a long time, I was scared of even like tiny house spiders. Like I just thought every spider was out to get me. They are. Um, <laughs> So that was very traumatic. And then the second thing that was traumatic was um, the first time I watched Nightmare on Elm Street. So I'm right there guys, with you. As you guys know, um, I go by Tina. And there's a character in the movie who's killed, whose name is Tina. And Freddy Krueger, like, calls her, right? He calls her out of the house, like, to her death scene. Tina, goes, get out of the Tina, house. Tina, Tina, right? Like, Shut up. Comes, she goes out of the house. Oh, somebody outside calling me. And then, yeah, and then of course he comes along. And for years after I saw that movie, I was convinced I heard Freddy Krueger calling me in the hallway. And my bedroom is at the end of the hallway. So, like, my parents' bedrooms, my sisters, and the bathrooms are all at the other end of this hallway. And I was by myself at the end of this hallway. And there was a little turn to go out of my room to get down this hallway. Blind spot. Right. There was a blind spot exactly where somebody could be lurking. And if I woke up in the middle of the night and had to pee, I would just lay there. <laughs> you better have been super nice to your siblings because <laughs> I would have been right in that hallway going, Dina, Dina don't get out of bed. <laughs> and um, I was sure that he would be there if I went around that that turn to that blind yeah, spot. So it actually took me a long, long time. I think not until I went to college before I could finally watch a Nightmare on Elm Street movie again. Um, I had a friend who loved those movies, thought they were funny, you know. Well, by the time um, you get to the third one, they are. Sure. Yeah. But she was always like, let's watch this. I'm like, no, I can't no. watch it. <laughs> Freddy Krueger scares me. <laughs> yeah. That's it. You're good. That's yeah. it. That's only like. That's nah. a, I just need to reveal a couple of traumas. Let's not get into I know for, yeah, I know we have to psychology. About this. <laughs> so. uh, you brought up Kingdom of the Spiders and I immediately thought Food of the Gods. 
Mm-hmm. Those giant oh, that's ones. another one. But it didn't, re- yeah. but it didn't really, that, but that's another one at the end where it, all of a sudden it pulls back and you see the milk and the cows are drinking out of the stream and then all the kids are drinking the milk and you're like, oh, they're all going to mutate. Let me tell you, I watched that recently and the disturbing thing about that is I think they're actually shooting rats during the- Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's no disclaimer at the bottom. No rats were, were <laughs> no, harmed in the making of this movie. No, there's not because they're, you know- Rats they're, were they're harmed. Giant yeah. rats and it's actual rats on a yeah. miniature set. Right, correct. Uh, and they're shooting them with shotguns, them and it probably, looks it like, like the probably pellet guns. Yeah. They're actually shooting them with something. It's yeah. a stuff film, huh? Wow. Yeah. Who knew that? Uh, you want to go next, Jim? You want me to jump in here? Uh, you can go. So, we we have had this discussion before because I'll tell you the first Jaws, obviously, as a kid, just my drive in 1975. I was probably seven years old. My grandparents lived on a lake, so yeah, that that loomed large for years and then my daughter came along it was obsessed with sharks and I actually outgrew my phobia to the point where I you know they weren't just mindless eaters I'm not getting in the ocean don't you know I'm not gonna go (laughs) swimming you know I see all these people oh that lady up in the main that was mistaken for a, a seal well that's what you get for swimming in this food chain but it's to the point now like we were gonna go to Hawaii and I wanted to go cage diving I want to go cage diving with great white sharks. And my wife is like, absolutely not. Not going to happen. I'm not doing it. So, uh, but that trip is canceled anyways. Uh, you mentioned Nightmare on Elm Street. And again, I was older. I saw it on VHS, probably senior year of high school. But that scene where the body bag is being dragged down the hallway in school and the blood trail, like that just really did not sit well with me. Um, but if you want to get into childhood traumas, the damn kid chaser in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. <laughs> oh, oh, kitties, I've got some candy. And he's dancing around and he's creepy looking as hell to begin with. And these stupid kids get in the cage. They get into the cabin, the wagon or whatever, and he takes them away. So he always freaked me out. I also brought up this in the last time, which is the opening credits of Josie and the Pussycats. There's a guy <laughs> found Google Glasses uh. And he, I don't remember, he's just a fat guy with these black Google round glasses. <laughs> and I was so scared of him when I slept, I used to have to be underneath my covers because if I had a leg or an arm outside of the, the sheets, he'd get mm-hmm. me. So I had That's... to be completely cocooned. But I go back now, I look at it and I'm like, there's nothing scary about this guy whatsoever. <laughs> was that know, guy was in an episode or was he just in yeah, the- It wasn't yeah. like they ever made specific, you know- Just for the title. Creatures just for the title sequence. Um, he probably was in an episode and I don't know what it was or what his powers were or just he was just a jerk those are mine that thing you're talking about Jeff blankets are magical yes, when you're a kid blankets can keep you safe if your yeah, body is yeah. under the blankets nothing can get you it's like an invisibility no. cloak mm-hmm. no. and, the, and the stools were always good to keep out of the lava yes when you're jumping from couch to couch mm. now we've covered this film already in its entirety on an episode of the show but my number one monster i was most frightened of was the blob Mm -hmm. and specifically the sequel beware the blob which was directed by larry hagman and there's yeah Yeah. i guess i never knew that he cameos in it along with burgess Mm -hmm. meredith dick van patten it is right we did cavalcade of stars what did we what did we pair that up with venom Venom. That's what. Yeah. I, that's right. Yep. Um, but there's so many haunting images that have stayed with me. First and foremost, the hippie that goes to get a haircut and the barber <laughs> dips his head into a <laughs> sink into full a sink. of blob. I never was comfortable getting a haircut out at a barber <laughs> shop after that. that Come on, feeling, James. Let's go wash your hair. No! The feeling of your neck being in that divot oh, in the I ceramic. Yeah, yeah. And the, you know, then then the the hose starting to go over your, your hairline back into your hair. I was just like expecting just b- to be enveloped yeah. from behind by this the blob. Yeah, and just the fact that whenever it eats something, it gets bigger. And at the right. end, it's like in this bowling alley and we were talking during the episode but like the things that were happening in this movie like a barber shop a bowling alley these are places that i would go when i was a kid that i frequented all the time so it was encroaching on my real life territory (laughs) damn blob um so that's do we do we eat jello at all jello i don't like jello but not because of the blob (laughs) i just don't like it that's the first thing that comes to mind the second thing that comes to mind is something it wasn't even the movie that i had seen back then it was the the commercial for it on wor 
I was watching um, the premiere. It was a one hour special on WOR of the Grease premiere. Or maybe it was Saturday Night Fever. It was something with John Travolta. And Gabe Kaplan was there being interviewed. And he's like, I'm so proud of this kid. I knew he was gonna go places just from when I, when I worked with him as Vinnie Barbarino on that show. And then they cut to commercial. And then it says at midnight tonight on WOR. And it was a commercial for children shouldn't play with dead things. And um, it was maybe of like a 20 second clip. And it's about these kids that go to a graveyard island. It's kind of like the, the Australia of graveyard islands because it's all like murderers and rapists and criminals that are buried on this island. And they go there, it's an acting troupe to kind of do like a, a seance. And the leader of the acting troupe is playing a practical joke on them because he's got people already staged on the island to scare them as they do this fake seance. But unbeknownst to him, the seance is actually real, the incantations that they're doing. The island erupts with zombies. And so there's a little cabin there and it's very Night of the Living Dead-esque and it came out only four years after Night of the Living Dead. So it owes a debt to that. But um, the, the commercial was the zombies coming out of the graves and there's one particular character who's running through the graveyard and the zombies are all clutching at him. And that stayed with me for years after. And that, the, the title alone of that movie gave me chills and I never saw it until I was an adult. And it is a weird, weird movie. And directed by Bob Clark, who directed A Christmas Story years later. <laughs> so I would like to, to watch that one day on this show. Jeff is Jeff. going, no, no. What are you doing to me? <laughs> Come on. Oh, I'd like to traumatize Jeff even more, and then we'll revisit these questions. It's What scared you as an adult, it's, Jeff? I think it's the first movie that actually <laughs> took that baton from Night of the Living Dead, and it's the first zombie movie in the Romero mold that came out after Night of the Living Dead. So I think it's worthy just in that regard. Only but, if we um, compare it up with Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. Oh, that would be a great. The, actually, the acting troupe looks so much like the Scooby Gang down to their. Work. Oh, see, now I'm in. Now I'm there's, in. <laughs> there's striped pants. There's ascots. There's the whole nine yards. Wow. Maybe Jeff, I have an important question for you. Yes. Have you seen Return to Zombie Island? I have not seen that yet. Okay. Is it good? Yeah. Yeah, it was funny. I okay. thought it was funny. Okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, I like all the. Scooby- yeah as you guys know since yeah. you okay, always sorry we didn't mean to derail island. you there sorry jim <laughs> and i i have to give a shout out to taurus trap as well jeff can attest to that Oof, that traumatized uh, him as an adult that, that's a that's a messed up flick right there would you guys pair it with hostile taurus trap what did we do oh ready or not we paired it with ready or not. okay yeah yeah. Wait, yeah. what did i just see you guys just mentioned ready or not the guys who did ready or not are remaking something i just saw this i literally just saw this i think yesterday scream that was it yes they're rebooting scream yep yeah that was i didn't it. realize i didn't know who the directors were but i did see an article about a new scream movie yeah i mean because wes craven did all the other yeah ones, so and obviously that's not possible now um unless we have a zombie wes wow that um, would be very interesting so that's i mean i think they they kind of work in that wheelhouse like that kind of well did like you ready, see ready or not yeah it has ready? sort of a you know sort of a dark comedy quality yeah it was definitely it. dark yeah it was black comedy for sure so, i liked it As a matter of fact it's shown up on uh, hbo a couple times and i've actually stopped and watched it so yeah those guys are gonna do um huh. the new scream so interesting yeah so like you said they just keep remaking this crap right horror, well, horror movies never right. die no, they don't. The no. Horror franchises never go away. So there's still a no. chance that someday there could be a yeah. drag me to hell. Michael, Michael Myers is 110 years old and he's still out there. And Jay, he's still chasing Jamie Lee Curtis. So. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. I would too. <laughs> so next so. week, we are again doing a newer movie. It's been out for a few weeks now. We are doing a Spike Lee movie. I don't feel cool enough to call it a Spike Lee joint. A I don't Spike think Lee I joint. should be calling it. Only no. Spike Lee can call it a Spike <laughs> Lee joint. The Five Bloods. And we are pairing it with... Um, the, De- dare I say, classic World <laughs> War II film, <laughs> Kelly's Heroes. I got a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling when I saw the movie poster. Oh my God, this looks fun. 
Same I don't genre. think I've seen it because I was confusing it with the Dirty Dozen. Oh my gosh, you guys have never seen either of you? I, I can honestly say I probably never seen I, I may have. I mean, it's, it's a star, it's a stellar cast. I it's definitely haven't. Uh, once, I, once I saw that Clint Eastwood is in it, I'm like, no, mm -hmm. I haven't seen yeah. this. No. Well, I'm looking forward to how you respond to this then. Don this Rickles. Is, this is a movie that I saw very, very young that my parents loved. And it has literally been, a, I feel like it's just been a part of my life, my whole life. So mm. I think it's going to be, I think you guys are going to enjoy this one. I think it's going right. to be a nice pairing yeah. too. Mm -hmm. It looks, yeah, Don Rickles, Carol O'Connor, Telly Savalas, Clint Eastwood. Telly yeah, Savalas? Yes. Really? Telly yes. Savalas? Yes. This cast is outstanding. This is Harry is Dean it... Stanton is in this movie. Wow. Yeah. Is, is Telly coming get... off of Horror Express doing this movie? Because that was this... his pinnacle, I think. What year was this? 70? 1970. 70. Because this year, weirdly, is the 50th anniversary of the film. And um, I went to do a little research to do like some background stuff. And I found a very recent interview with Donald Sutherland huh. about the film. Because That's it's why it confused me. Because he's, I think yeah. he's in The Dirty Dozen as well. Donald Sutherland. I, it's been a long, long time since I've seen The Dirty Dozen. I do not remember him being in that. I remember him being in MASH. Yeah, right. he was in MASH as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah. All right. So that's so it. Next that's, week. So that's uh, what we're doing next week. Yeah. So uh, get your fatigues you... on, and we'll, you go. Uh, we'll see you in the trench next week. We're going to start looking for gold. <laughs> Digging for gold. Go ahead. Right, go. Goodbye, everybody. Yes, thank you for listening once thank again. Thank you. Enjoy your week, and uh, we'll catch up with you next time. Ciao. Hello, everybody. If you liked the podcast you just heard, then please follow TMI on all of our social media outlets. First and foremost, email us at tmipodcast2018 at gmail.com. That is tmipodcast2018 at gmail.com. And you can follow us on Twitter at TMI underscore podcast 2018. Step over, say hi, give us a compliment. We'd love to hear from you. Awesome. Uh, make sure you follow us on Instagram as well, which is also uh, TMI underscore podcast 2018. And of course, we are on Facebook, facebook.com slash TMI podcast 2018. And it should be noted, we also have a community page. So join the forum. And if you like to watch YouTube, you can see us at TMI podcast 2018, all one word. Look for the popcorn bucket. Popcorn bucket. Or you could just go to our website, which has every link there. TMI confessionals podcast.com. And we'll see you at the concession stand. We'll save some popcorn yep. for you. Grandma saggy ass.